in, uh, I can't believe it was this long ago, 2004, 16 years ago plus, um, a very famous book was written. It was something like, uh, no, here it is, Your Best Life Now. Uh, it was written by a guy, I'm not going to talk much about him per se. Um, I, I don't necessarily recommend the book. Um, it's, it's popular psychology. It, it has some things in it that aren't necessarily bad. It ha I, I know the, the gist of the book. It covers topics that I used to cover when I was teaching leadership in the Air Force. There's stuff in there that's, that's completely rational stuff about how to live a better life. Uh, my chief complaint with the book is that it makes it seem like God's primary purpose in life is to make you happy, which I don't agree with. It's funny, though, that that book that was totally devoted, the, the entire thrust of the book was this idea that God really wants you to be completely happy right this second. And, um, and it hit the, the bestseller list. It stayed there for two years. They've sold 8 million copies, and it's hard to talk to anybody who hasn't, even heard, who hasn't at least heard of the book, like even not Christian people. It's very hard to talk to anybody, at least in America, that um, doesn't know about that book. Uh, and it, it, illustrates, it illustrates something about the church. Perhaps that after centuries of being taught, live as a Christian, and someday you'll get the rewards in heaven. The church was desperate for someone to say, no, 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 God wants you to be happy right this second. There's rewards right now. You can live better now. And that, that idea isn't completely false. It isn't completely false that God doesn't want your life to be better now. God actually does want your life to be better now. I would suggest that the book of Proverbs would be a place to go for that information, however, as that's exactly why Proverbs was written. It was written specifically and ideally, more so than any other book in the entire Bible, on how to improve the way you live here and now on this planet tomorrow, the next week, and how to make it go better. Proverbs was written for that express purpose. And that's the book that we're going to be in if you want to go there. Uh, I had pointed out last week that there is a big difference between the way Proverbs reads in the New International Version and in the version that I often use, which is the New American Standard. Um, I was not aware of how big that, but it makes sense. The NIV is a paraphrase, and Proverbs sound a lot different when they're a little bit paraphrased. Um, but uh, it turned out to be interesting. So I am actually going to read some out of the NIV today, and we're going to skip back and forth to the New American Standard, just so you know. But I'll keep you informed about where we're going as we go. But we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to talk about what's necessary if we want... If we want to get the benefit of Proverbs, and we want our life to go smoother, and we want our finances to go smoother, and we want our families to go smoother, we'd like all that to go better, how do we get there? So we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 4, and the first bit I'm going to read is from the NIV 1 through 6. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Here are my children the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Solomon is talking about, he's painted a picture about his family. Notice he says, in the New American Center, it says, the only son of my mother. Uh, David had several wives. Uh, Solomon was by no means the first or only child of David. He was the 
first and only child of Bathsheba. That's, the, that's why when you read it, it says the only son of her. It's because he was the only son of Bathsheba. And he's talking about, this is David. This is Solomon talking about the advice that David gave him growing up. I mean, that's what we're looking into here. This isn't just some words on a page. This is a specific person talking about a specific relationship with another specific person that we actually know quite a bit about from the Word of God. We know what David was like. We know who he was. We know that David was a man after God's own heart. We know that David was a a rich person, not just in finances, but in his wisdom of how he dealt with God. And so Solomon's father mentored him from a young age. And we can probably get a pretty good idea, not just from this passage, but just going back at who David was, at the sort of stuff David would have told Solomon to do. Solomon, right here in chapter 4, is telling us the importance of having a spiritual mentor. For some of us, it is a father or a mother. Uh, I know in my case... For sure, my parents were the first spiritual mentors I had. I had some Sunday school teachers. I had some pastors. I had some stuff. I'm one of those kids that was in the church from the beginning. But nobody in my life had the same impact on my life as my parents, hands down. Not everybody has that. I get it. So I'm not going to stand here and tell you that that, uh, we have to read this. And so um, go back to your, your mother or father and make sure that they give you spiritual understanding. Your mother or father may not be capable of giving you spiritual understanding. I get that. They may not be still alive. There's a lot of things that could be about that. But here's what is true. All of us need a spiritual mentor. Let me tell you why we need a a human being as a spiritual mentor as opposed to just a book or even just the Bible. Let me tell you why it's valuable to have a spiritual mentor over and above what you read. I'm just going to talk to you about my experience. Here it goes. I read the, even the Bible or some book written by some really smart person uh, or whatever. I read that and you know what? Nine times out of ten, I finish that and I'm self-congratulatory. Well, I'm doing pretty good, huh? I have a hard time being honest with myself. I tend to read things and think I'm doing them. I tend to read, you should do these five things. Yeah, I I do those five things. I tend to lie to myself. And I tend to do it even when I'm reading this. I tend to read the Bible and think I'm doing better than I really am. If you don't have someone in your life that's able to look you in the eye and tell you that you're lying, you're missing something vital you need. You need somebody in your life that will look you in the face and go, nope, not so good. You're not doing quite as well as you thought. And if you don't have that, then you're not going to be on the path to wisdom because you're always going to think you're doing way better than you really are because we do this. We do this thing. We all do this thing. That's why I use myself as an example. We, as human beings, do this thing of thinking of ourselves higher than we should. And so, as, as Solomon's starting to go into this, he's saying, I needed a spiritual mentor who would keep pushing it, who would keep talking to me, who would keep driving it home, who wouldn't let me go, yeah, I already know that. No, you don't already know that. You need some more. So here's your first homework assignment. We've barely even started and you got your first homework assignment. Here's your first one. If your mother or father or both do have a spiritual context in your life of any kind, call them this week. Thank them. Talk with them. Because, because you are so blessed if you have a mother and or father that is 
cares about you spiritually and prays about you and poured into you when you were young, if you have that, you, you need to remember how incredibly blessed you are. And you need to thank them. And you need to pour more into that relationship than you probably want to. Because it's right. If you don't have that, but you have someone else who has filled that role, do the same thing. If there's somebody else in your life that, that was instrumental, that was rich, and they're still alive, and you know them, and it's been maybe months or even years since you talked to them, and yet you know if it weren't for them, you wouldn't know Jesus Christ, call them and thank them. This week, call them, talk with them, reestablish your relationship with them. Talk about what's going on in your life. Let them speak into your life. They did it before. They'll do it again. Let people who have been in spiritual leadership in your life hear your story, hear what you're going through today, and, and speak into it. Because if you're blowing it, they'll tell you. And you, we need to hear it. We need spiritual mentors in our life that are willing to step in and say, actually, you need to fix this. Three, if you don't have anyone like that in your life, you need one. Maybe you know who it's supposed to be and you haven't asked them, or maybe you don't have a clue. If you don't have a clue, come talk with me and we'll see if we can't get a clue together. We'll try to get a clue. But we need, all of us need, spiritual mentorship in our life. We're not going to get anywhere near wisdom without it. And then we move into verse 7. Verse 7 is interesting. I'm going to take two thoughts out of verse 7. I'm going to read it out of the NIV first. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all your getting, get understanding. That sounds a little awkward, doesn't it? Here, it's even more awkward in my version. You want to hear this one? It's, it just, here's the, here it is in the New American Standard Version. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your understanding, get understanding. Or I'm sorry, with all your acquiring, get understanding. Hard, 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 hard. And here's why it's hard. Because it's written in Hebrew, not English. And there's some Hebrew thoughts here that are just not easy to, to translate out. And so they come out really different. As we're working to try to make the Hebrew into English, the translators are really struggling. This isn't an easy one. So let me see if I can't unravel this just a little bit. Because actually there's two really important principles here. The first one, I think, is, is more understandable out of the New American Standard, even though it sounds weird. It says, the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. As awkward as that sounds, there's actually a really important idea here, and I'll, I'll see if I can't explain it to you. Wishing to have something is not the same thing as planning and doing something about getting it. Okay. Okay. Make it really easy. Imagine two kids playing Xbox on the couch. Teenagers, 14, right? They're playing Xbox. And one says, man, I wish I had a million dollars. Oh, yeah, that'd be so cool. I'd love to have a million dollars. What would you do with a million dollars? And they talk for an hour about what they would do with a million dollars. They're playing Xbox. What they're doing will not get them any money. It will not make them richer. What they're doing with their lives will not get them any richer. They're not getting a job. They are not doing anything to solicit. They're not investing. They're not doing anything at all to get a million dollars. They just want a million dollars. Okay, you can want wisdom all you want. Until you start acquiring wisdom, you will go nowhere. So if your life is a mess and it's a shambles and you think to yourself, man, I sure was, uh, was wiser... And then you just go back to doing all the same stuff you were doing yesterday. Your wish means nothing. Your wish is pointless. Your wish does nothing. So his first point is, 
you actually have to do something about getting wisdom if you want it. You have to make a plan. You have to have some ideas. Getting that mentor would be a great first start. If you had a spiritual mentor, they would help you make a plan of what to do, and then you would need to commit to that plan. You'd need to actually execute it on a regular basis and do something with your week and change what you read or what you think or how you make your decisions. You'd actually have to change what you do. So I, I realize it sounds awkward, but there's actually a really important idea there. You can want wisdom all you want, but you're not going to start to get it until you actually go get it. That's the idea. And as basic as that is, billions of people don't. The planet is full of people who have not ever tried to get any wiser. And they sometimes wish, especially when things are going badly, that they were wiser. But they're not doing anything about it. So your second homework assignment is, what am I doing in my life to actually acquire wisdom, to do better? Maybe you are doing something. If you are, recommit. If not, you might want to think about that. Proverbs would be a great place to start, not just hearing it in sermons, but reading it for yourself. If you feel like you've devoured Proverbs and you've really got it down, Job and Ecclesiastes would be next. If you feel like you've got those nailed, you can come see me. We'll talk about where else you can go. The second half of, of verse 7 is also a little difficult to understand. It says, In all your getting, get understanding. In all you're getting, get understanding. If you chew on that for just a little bit, it does start to, to fill in. Don't get anything without getting understanding too. Again, there's another nuance to that. In the numeric standard, it says... Um, ba -dum, ba -dum. Yeah, in all you're acquiring, get understanding. In all you're acquiring. We acquire a lot of stuff. But we often don't acquire any understanding with it. Another, another version says, whatever the cost, acquire understanding. Though it cost you all you have. Uh, I'd like to, you to know that uh, you can buy wisdom um, for $54.95. I'll happily provide you with a diploma of wisdom alkalite. For $320, bucks, I would give you the, the professional wise guy certificate. And for $1,000, I'd be happy to give you a Zen master of wisdom certificate. So if you'd like wisdom and you just want to pay me some cash, I'd be happy to hand you. It is foolish. Why did I make that joke? What was I trying to illustrate? That we often think wisdom is something we can buy by purchasing a book or attending a seminar or getting a gadget or buying a planner. We want to reduce wisdom down to something I can pull my money out of my wallet and somehow just buy it. And that's not how wisdom works. And you laughed when I said, if you pay me money, I'll give you a certificate of wisdom because it was funny. And yet we often make decisions thinking that somehow I can purchase wisdom if I can just get this thing, this right program for my computer, this app for my phone, and suddenly I'll be wise and I'll do wise things. That isn't true. Everything has a cost. Nothing valuable is free. I can see some of you guys' wheels turning when I say that nothing valuable is free because those of you who are thinking about Jesus 
Christ, you might go, ah, salvation's free. You, you talk about that all the time, Pastor. Actually, and that, when I say salvation, I'm talking about this thing that Pete was talking about when he said the restored relationship with God, that thing that, we're, that we need desperately. We need this restored relationship with God. That was free in, the, in that we don't have to pay the price, and yet it wasn't free. Let me tell you two reasons why it isn't free. One, gifts aren't free. They just weren't paid for by you. No such thing as a free lunch, but there are extravagant gifts. The difference is that extravagant gifts were paid for by someone who loved you. That's what salvation's about. It's an extravagant gift paid for by Jesus Christ, by someone who loved you deeply. It wasn't free. It just wasn't paid for by you. Two, there is a personal cost of a form in becoming a Christian that, that can't be taken out of the equation. We use the word repentance, that you have to repent to become a Christian, and that's a fancy Christian word for you've got to realize you can't do it yourself. That's a cost many people are not willing to pay. The pride cost of admitting I can't do this on my own is a pride cost many people won't ever pay in their whole life. They would far rather say, no, I've got this figured out. I'll work it out. I'll do it. I'll do anything I need to in order for someone else not to tell me what to do because I don't like other people telling me what to do. So whatever it takes for no one else to tell me what to do, I'll do that and, and hope for the best. If that's your plan, I have a warning for you. The Bible says it's not going to work. The Bible says that if you try your own plan and you're relying on your understanding of how you're going to work this out, that your relationship with God will not be restored and it won't go well. We have to submit ourselves to God. That's a price many people aren't willing to pay. And in that sense, this willingness to admit that we're wrong, salvation and wisdom have something in common. Because you can't gain either one without admitting that you're wrong or that you need more. I, um, I have a memory of a conversation. I could not even tell you who it was. It was with a little girl. She was about eight and, um, and she was good at math. And she'd gotten some really good grades in math, really good grades in math. And, and, uh, and she was really proud of herself. And I congratulated her on her good math, because that's good. And this is what she says. Yes, I know everything about math. Now, that, that statement that she made... I chose not to react to, but everything inside me wanted to scream in her face, no, no, you don't, no, you don't. You do not know everything about math. You have no idea how much about math you don't know. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. You're very, very wrong. You don't know everything about math. But I did not say that. You see, she, but why wouldn't she think that, right? See, she'd been given some data to absorb, She'd been given some ideas, some processes. She hadn't been given any more. She'd been given that. And then she had learned it, and she'd processed it, and she understood it. And then she took a test, and everyone told her how smart she was, and she got an A on her paper. Why wouldn't she think she knew everything about math? Folks, we live this way about so many things. And particularly spiritually, I meet people all the time. They've been exposed to a few spiritual ideas, maybe a verse or two from the Bible, a couple different ideas from maybe this religion and that one and a smattering from that. And they've digested it and they've processed it and they've said some things that sounded really smart to them and very wise to them. And all their friends said, oh, that sounds really wise. And they've gotten feedback that they're really wise and smart. And why wouldn't they think, I've got this all figured out. I've got it. I know everything there is to know about God. No, no, you don't. <laughs> See, Here's where wisdom comes in. If that eight-year-old girl studying math 
continues to study, she's going to discover there's some things she didn't know yet, and she'll learn those. And if she keeps studying, she'll learn a little bit more. And then there's going to come a magic moment in her life as she keeps studying math. And maybe she'll be really good. Maybe this was so long ago that this eight-year-old girl is way better at math than I am today. I'm not telling you that she's not any good at math. But here's what will happen somewhere along the line. Somewhere she's going to go, I will never know all the math there is to know. That thought will occur to her. That knowledge, that, that realization. And the moment that happens, that's the moment she starts to get wise about math. She had no wisdom about math before then. She had knowledge about math, but until she went, I will never know all there is to know about math. She had no wisdom yet. Wisdom starts when you realize what you don't know. That's when it starts. And that takes humility. That takes a willingness for me to say, I don't know. I don't have it all figured out. I'm not enough. My brain and my understanding and my plan isn't sufficient. You see, that's the beginning of wisdom. It doesn't start in anything until we're ready to say that then you don't have wisdom yet. You might have some knowledge. You might have some skills. You might have capability. You might have a lot, but you don't have wisdom yet. Not until you're willing to recognize what you don't know. So that's one of the costs of acquiring. But the phrase says, and in all you're getting, get understanding. When you get stuff, get understanding. Uh, I heard a story on Friday night at, at Cape Youth. I'm not going to mention the people, but you probably already know, but that's okay. By principle, I will not say names. But I heard a story Friday night, and here's what the story went like this. There was a little boy who was in a car, and he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. And the family gets pulled over. Mom and dad don't know. The little boy doesn't have a seatbelt on. Cop comes in, says, hey, did you know your son wasn't wearing a seatbelt? Oh, no, he didn't know. Uh, and then they kind of like, uh, you know, we're just going to get a slap on the hand, right? No, 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 $150 fine. Poof. Your son wasn't wearing the seatbelt? You're getting the fine. Ow. They got something. They got a fine. But apparently, the little boy got more than a fine because he paid part of that fine. He also apparently got some understanding because later, when there was a car crash, and it was a mighty car crash, it was a flip over and over car crash kind of mess, he had his seatbelt on. So clearly, he got some understanding with his fine. But I know this little boy today. And I know that this little boy today has an attitude about authority that that this person values the fact that even though he may not understand all the rules, he understands that they're valuable because in that car crash, he got some more understanding. He got some understanding that hey, I got a fine, and then I wore my seatbelt, and then it saved my life. And that gave him more understanding. In his getting, he got understanding. We have three choices when bad things happen to us. I say bad, difficult, hard, challenging things happen to us. We have three choices. One, we can just be bitter and angry about it. Okay. Okay. That is not wise. You won't get anything. You will get nothing. You will just get heartburn and anger and frustration and you'll hold a grudge against whatever it was and then you can be angry at them, I guess, forever. That's not going to do anything great for you. It's unwise. The next level of wisdom would be to wait for God to rescue you or to wait upon God or to have faith that God would take care of it and then be thankful that God provided. That's good. There is nothing wrong with that. We can have difficulty and we can have hardship and we can put our faith in God 
and we can and we can wait upon the Lord, and when He delivers and when He rescues, we can rejoice and we can, can give Him glory and we can thank Him. I would call that the first level of wisdom. That's good. That that is a wonderful thing, and it will. It will cleanse you of bitterness and it will put all the focus where it needs to go and it will help you see the sovereignty and glory of God. It is not all that you could get. Here's the next step. Difficult, hard, whatever happens and I get understanding from it. I get wisdom from it. I learn something from it. I grow in it. Are you ready to get understanding in all you're getting? Whatever it is that you get, are you ready to to tear into it and pull it apart and keep reading until you find something to learn, some way to grow, some way to be better, some way to learn about God's purpose, some, some weakness about yourself that needs to be addressed? What can you discover in the hard moment that allows you to become wiser, smarter, more understanding, better equipped, what can you drag out of it? See, that's, that's the full scope away from, I'm just mad that that policeman pulled me over. Why did he do that? And why couldn't he have just given us a warning? The full edge of the other side is, Thank you, God, for that wake-up call. Thank you that you've provided us with the money to pay for that ticket, and clearly I had a lesson to learn here. I need to change the way that I sit in my car. That was dumb of me. Lord, help me change who I am, what I do, fix what happens. The problem oftentimes is, though, that we do not want to live that way. We want to live casually. We just want to let things happen. And we want, we actually kind of enjoy, I kind of enjoy when bad things happen. I kind of like stewing in my anger a little bit. Well, those creepy, no good, awful, how dare they. And we wallow in that a little bit and it feels really good just to be angry and to, to contemplate the unjustness of what we're in. And to imagine how many ways that they're wrong. We're really good at that, aren't we? Having these imaginary conversations in our head where we win (laughs) so greatly against our imaginary opponent and we've clearly expressed to them how wrong they are about everything. And we miss completely any opportunity for us to grow. (laughs) For us to learn, for us to mature, for us to fix, to be fixed. See, Proverbs is meant to make your life better, but there's no quick, easy, painless way to that path. No one's going to hand you a platter and just say, look, here's a better life. And anyone who promises that is promising you a lie. No such thing. James 1 2 says, Rejoice when you encounter various trials because of what they produce in you, the endurance and the change and the improvement that happens in you when you face them. If you want wisdom, we have to start addressing and looking at the situations of our life, the things that happen in all of our stuff in a new and different way. We have to be willing to get every bit out of it that we can. This has been a very practical sermon about very practical stuff. But I would just like to return to one point I made earlier about something that's similar between wisdom and salvation. Wisdom and making your life right with God. We can't it right with God until we're ready to say not my way but your way. And if you're in a place where you're struggling with that my way or God's way question I would love to encourage you. God has a way and it's free and it's beautiful and it costs you nothing and it costs Christ everything 
the one thing you're going to have to do, though, is admit that you need him. You're going to have to do that. If you're ready to admit you need God, I am super ready to tell you about how much he loves you. I'd love to talk with you. So the last piece of homework, the first one was contact that mentor or get one. Two, do you actually have a plan for how to acquire wisdom? Are you purposefully living your life to get wiser? And number three, our last one is, do I need to adjust the way I look at the things that happen to me in my life? Do I need to adjust the way I look at difficulty and trial and struggle? Am I really squeezing all of the understanding and value, goodness out of it? Where am I in that continuum between I'm just mad about it to I can be thankful that God has it to all the way to how do I get better through it? Where am I? And do we need to adjust? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you want us to live well. And we're reading a book now here, God, that you've, you've provided us. You've provided us a very specific manual about practical living. How do we day by day live our lives so that we can live smarter, better, with a better character, God, with a better understanding, with more patience, with more wisdom. These are good things to pursue. God, would you, would you convict us of where we need to practically alter what we do? And Lord, if there is any person in this room who simply needs to go, you know, I don't know how to do this, and I really want to hear about how God wants me to do this. Would you give them the courage to ask me or someone else that might know in this room? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.